What's up everybody, Chris Delion here, and it's been a few months since I've done a YouTube video, but here's, I think, an incredibly important tip about getting more freedom and flexibility and control over what you're doing in your life. Now, this is something that, in my mind, as always, I direct towards my fellow game developers out there, but it really applies to a lot of people in a lot of walks of life who are just looking for more freedom, more control, more say over what they're doing. But it's not about programming, it's not about design, it's not about art, it's none of that stuff. It's about lifestyle. And this is something that... I'm going to be able to echo and support with some game developers who are frankly way more successful than I am financially and otherwise. People have noticed over the years that I've had a lot of flexibility in what I've been doing, that I've been able to make iPhone, iPad games independently for a while. I was able to do research for a while, but uh, going and out, back out of graduate school and so on. Uh, and since then, I've been teaching independently, completely on my own, one-on-one -on -one with people. And that's been great. That's been really life-fulfilling. But let me be clear about something. Part of what's made all that flexibility possible is because I am living as cheaply as I can. And I don't mean miserly, not like stockpiling money somewhere. What I mean is that I have a very low standard of living in terms of my expenses. I, I literally buy 65 cent ramen by the case. Um, I have for years. When I was making those paid iPhone and iPad games, I wasn't in a mansion. I was literally splitting half of a trailer home with somebody. All right. When I lived in San Francisco, San Francisco seems like an amazing and a big, a cool city, and it is. I was in the cheapest, most affordable uh, area I was living in to be there. And I was basically living in a closet, not fooling around. I'm pretty sure it was a closet that kind of converted. Stick a bed in anything, it kind of becomes a bedroom, right? Uh, this message has been echoed. So, you know, I help organize the Indicate Game Use stuff. And last year, we brought up Rami Ismail to talk about business stuff. One of his tips for any developers, and this is coming from Rami Ismail of uh, Vlambeer, right? Who's in, uh, their games are immensely successful. You know their stuff. One of his messages was spend money like you don't have any. Like don't buy a $3 soda from someplace. That's a lot of money. That's a waste of money. Don't buy bottled water, right? Tap water's fine. And to echo this, right? So so Cliffy B of Epic and, uh, you know, Gears of War, Jazz Jackrabbit, for those of you as old as I am, uh, someone was asking him two years ago, like, what is the best advice for future game programmers? And he said, Stay out of the bar scene. That's all his response was. Someone says, okay, can you elaborate? Cliffy B comes back. You know, like, he barely went out in his teens and 20s. He was driven. He wanted to make games more than anything else. It, it's, it's not about being anti-alcohol. It's not about being anti-social. It's not about being anti-anything. It's about the fact, like, that's really expensive. Those costs pile up. Part of why I've been able to squeak by when I've had to squeak by is because I'm not going out and just, you know, casually buying expensive liquor. Otherwise, what you get is sort of a variation of what people call golden handcuffs. And sometimes golden handcuffs means really, really expensive stuff, like at the golden parachute level. Uh, but one of the versions of what golden handcuffs can mean is basically that someone feels locked into a lifestyle because they're making X amount of money and they can't imagine shifting their plans unless they're making at least that amount of money. Right? They feel like they'd be going backwards. They feel like they'd be losing progress if they stepped from a high paying job into an avenue or direction in life where they're making less money. And I've got friends who are trapped in some ways, at big company jobs where they are, despite working on properties or brands or other things that you've heard of, that it's cool that they're a part of that and they like that and they feel okay about that. They don't have the freedom or flexibility to do the independent thing because their living situation, because their expenses, because their whatever it is that they've accumulated that they're paying off or this, that, and the other um, doesn't give them the flexibility to, to pull that back. When I stepped out of AAA into doing independent games, well, heck, in the middle. When I took a step out of AAA, even just to work at my friend's casual web game startup, uh, this would have been seven, eight years ago, I took about a 75% pay cut to make that shift. And that was something which has been a good vector for me in life that otherwise would not have been possible if I would have insisted I'm not going to take a job unless it pays at least as well as what I'm doing now. You know, for the brief window in my life when I was pulling a bigger paycheck from a bigger company, like me and my roommates at the time, we just split the cost of a really ridiculously expensive television because it seemed like at the time, like, oh, that's what you do when you're making that scale of money and you just not even think twice about it. And that applied to so many little purchases throughout. Uh, whereas, you know, so since then that TV has gone off with those roommates, my TV for the years since is actually one I picked up for 50 bucks in someone's lawn sale. That, that arcade cabinet in the background is actually a wooden case uh, a fellow game developer gifted me when he had to get it out of his apartment because had another one going to his apartment. Uh, it has a little Mac mini in there. That's my old machine from 2005, 2006, whatever. It's running Linux for my main emulation. Uh, it's not like I went out and spent a bunch of money on a real arcade cabinet. Uh, so, you know, like I say, it's, it's like you, you, you almost stop paying attention to how much money you're spending until you start to realize, like, if you build these habits, 
they trap you. They, they, they put you in a corner where you got to maintain that. And part of what I figured out when I was living in really, really, really low cost circumstances in the past was that if I just didn't spend $300 a month, it's like I had just earned $300 a month, right? And it's, it's the old Ben Franklin quote, which sounds ridiculous because of course back then it was a penny. Now it's $300 or whatever. But I, I've got another friend too. She works at a company that pays her really well and she's going paycheck to paycheck because she's living someplace that's really stretching her means. And again, that's, get, that's, that's taking away her flexibility to change paths in life if she so chose. And this actually also was inspired by a note from a EA founder. Again, I like to point out these people who are far more successful and visible than I am. EA founder Bing Gordon was 2005. And he was saying, don't make your decisions based, especially right out of college or whatever, based on what seems to be best paying. Make it on what's going to be best for your long-term opportunities. Because if you have even some basic fiscal responsibility for saving some of your money, for trying to stay out of debt as much as you can. And again, there's certain things that can education is investments. Now I'm talking about here not going out and buying things you can't afford or whatever, racking up credit card debt and so on. He said, if you have some basic financial responsibility, fiscal responsibility, you'll kind of have enough money a few years after, as long as you have like a job. And that too many people make the mistake straight out of there trying to, you know, they, they, they cast out their, their antenna. They find what's the highest paying thing I can do. They go straight there. And part of what they're being paid for some of those situations, I mean, they're not going to say this up front. Part of what they're really being paid for though, is that that's money in exchange for basically keeping them trapped there. Basically a lack of flexibility, a lack of freedom, a lack of sometimes even saying what they're doing. Whereas plenty of other people go out there, they find a way to find, derive more joy out of what they're doing. They find more way to have more flexibility in what they're making for who and how, get to have more direct say. I like to think of it as being a bigger part of something small instead of a smaller part of something big, right? Which it's a different kind of fulfillment that comes out of it. It's a different kind of value that comes out of it but it's it's a lot more freeing for somebody than being a piece and it's also it's, it's some of it's too it's about being finding ways to matter that you're you and this sounds bizarre but let me see, explain what i mean by that when i was at a huge company which will remain nameless i you know my whole life i've been trying to figure out like how to make it matter than i'm me how do i differentiate my skills how do i differentiate my my abilities how do i differentiate what i do and what I was gradually figuring out while I was there was that they didn't want that. They don't care for that. They don't want somebody doing something different than somebody else they could bring in in my place. They needed me to be replaceable. And at a huge company scale, that makes sense because, you know, the way giant companies operate is that no matter who gets hit by a bus, it can't affect the stock. It can't affect the bottom line. It can't affect the release or anything like that. So they need people to be in these like nicely patterned circle pegs for circle holes, square pegs for square holes. Like they, so that's kind of how the whole thing gets structured around the promotions, around the job titles, around all this kind of deal. One of the things that I figured out uh, early on in my career that surprised the heck out of me, completely shocked me, I used to think that giant companies, giant institutions, giant corporations, IBM, Microsoft, unit airports, who knows, right? Uh, big game publishers were all filled with just amazingly expert people, amazing geniuses. And what I eventually figured out was it's actually quite not that case. Now, don't get me wrong. There are talented people there. There are smart people there. There's hardworking people there. Uh, but they are maybe a little less exceptional or unusual than one might assume. Because part of what really what makes those those institutions work is that they have found a way to work no matter who's involved in the process, to make all the parts interchangeable, to make all the positions swappable. So that if somebody disappears, somebody takes off, somebody quits, somebody gets replaced, who knows? Doesn't matter. They hire someone else in those shoes. And that again, like I use, I like to use the airport for example, where it's like on the one hand, you could have one mega genius trying to run everything at an airport. Instead, they have found a way to distribute it over thousands of jobs so that people who are barely caring about the end result somehow manage to keep planes taking off and landing every day, right? That at a place like IBM or Microsoft or Google or whoever, don't get me wrong, it, there's smart people there, but at the end of the day, their financial success, it's all about having thousands of people, all of them are filling in these various little pieces and parts of the process that if that person takes off, not going to skip a beat. They replace that role next day and it's fine. And it's just a different way of thinking about it that the people in those processes aren't really what's important. It's those processes at that bigger scale. If you think that this doesn't apply to video game development, think about how on giant game teams, you know, so like when the lead, when Hideo Kojima leaves or takes off or moves around, people notice. When Dave Jones, a uh, former Grand Theft Auto, Crackdown, kind of Lemmings history, changes companies, people, people might notice. 
when, you know, Will Wright or Sid Meier, when those, there's like a handful of people, we can probably count them on one or two hands, that when they move around in the game industry, Shigeru Miyamoto, we notice those things. But how much does anybody else really, really notice when everybody else on a team, or heck, even the whole company switches out between one Halo game and the next, between one Twisted Metal game and the next, between one game and franchise and the next one, how many people are noticing when people switch in and out of the Madden teams or the FIFA teams? And let's get real, people don't, right? This, those teams are designed to function not because of who's on that team, but regardless of who's on that team to an extent, as long as they have a certain filter of people coming in that they're setting as their bar for hiring quality. Versus when I was at a smaller company and it mattered who the four or five or six people were. It still matters who I am when I'm working one-on-one -on -one with people, teaching them online, you can bet it matters for what I know, what I've done and so on. And that to me is much more fulfilling than getting a better paycheck for being someplace else where, frankly, I've got to be a replaceable bit. What's his name? Speaker trainer Steve Siebel talks about as differentiating yourself, you know, are you or are you not a commodity? And, you know, he focuses on public speaking. And so for him, he says, like, if when you give a speech, people are there not because of who you are, but because of what you're talking about, people aren't there because of who's giving the talk. They're there because you're talking about you know, how to use X, Y, or Z tool, how to do the X, Y, or Z thing with it, then at that point you're a commodity because you're replaceable because someone else could speak on that same topic. What you want to do is try to find ways to maneuver yourself through life so it matters that if you can't make it, they're going to cancel it. They're not just going to shove someone else in your place to do the thing that, you know, anybody out there could do. This is a big deal to me, partly because I think, you know, people out there see either visibility or occasional recognition or other random stuff that I've done that their impression is that I've been successful somehow because I had, uh, you name it, uh, likes or visibility or award or plays or whatever. It's my game that got 7 million plays plus, I mean, that's now a couple years old stat. And then what was it? Mochi bot died out on us. So we don't actually know anymore. And we saw $0 from that. That game made us literally zero money. We didn't stick ads in it. We just built it because we thought it'd be anything to build and took off. And that was great. Um, games I've released that got me, uh, finalist at Indicate years before I got involved with helping to, to organize this stuff. Uh, that game also made me next to nothing. Now, sometimes those things can be leveraged to help create some other opportunity. So, you know, I point to those things when I'm trying to get someone to help me work with them one-on-one, -on -one, or I would point to those things if I was trying to land contract to work with somebody about like, look, here's evidence that I can do this stuff. But those things themselves didn't equate to anything. Because here's another fact about when I say find ways to reduce your costs, lots and lots and lots of people out there this is not just me. This is a story for a lot of people out there. Uh, you may get the impression that they have been succeeding for years. I, heck, uh, uh, bands, right? So there's this great story I read some years ago. I think it was Blink-182 or somebody. They were opening for all these different major bands. They were traveling all over the country. And you would assume from that that they were already immensely successful, but they were absolutely scraping by. That they were definitely sort of in a point of struggle and a lot of uncertainty for a long time before they took off and kind of built their own identity. That is the story almost everywhere. All right. I mean, so there's a long period of uncertainty, a long period of struggle, a long period of, of having to get by with making little. Like I say, find ways to still lower your costs. Find ways to lower your, expensive, uh, lower your expenses. Or if you haven't yet stepped into those shoes of having high costs to maintain, uh, consider when you're looking at different opportunities, like I say, that old Ben Gordon tip of not looking first and foremost at what pays the best, but perhaps in the long run, what might be the best career opportunity, what might be the best thing to help build your identity, your value uh, throughout your life. Um, or, you know, for a lot of indie developers, they make this decision of they'll step away from a bigger, well-paying company in exchange for having more control over the game they want to build because it's more important to them that they get to build the game that they want to build than it is that they are getting a little extra money every year but never having real say over what they're doing. Now, I've talked about it before in an old blog entry. This is actually one of the weird things that shook me up when I was at the uh, big AAA company, realizing how many coworkers there had never got to build their game, right? They might have game ideas. They didn't even get to see their game ideas in it because they weren't the person who was the creative lead or whatever. They, they're a hand animator. They're a lighting expert. They're a, you name it. There's something else on the team. They might even be a level designer, but they're not at a position where they get to decide what gets built. And then even at the top tier, right? You would assume that these people at the top tier would get to say, but even then they're following orders of what someone else in the company says, this will be profitable. Here's the franchise we're doing another iteration of. And it's just such a weird machine in that it's, it's, it's sad because I see people who put years into trying to become professional game developers 
figure out pretty quick that that's not really the same thing as getting to build the games that they want to build. Some of those same people then go on and find that their real freedom comes from finding something else day to day to earn their paychecks, to keep their income, to keep themselves afloat, and then find ways to keep their game projects in the evenings and the nights and the weekends, which sounds, some people sound sad. I think an Onion made a joke article about that kind of thing. Uh, but it means you have total freedom to build whatever you please, to whatever you feel like, take whatever experiments, whatever chances you feel like making and having and doing. That's its own reward sometimes, building those things, getting the trout things you want, learning lessons you want to learn from it. Uh, but anyway, I just wanted to chat about that for a bit. I think it's a super important point. Uh, like I said, it affects a lot of game developers. It affects a lot of people who aren't game developers either. And uh, that's it for now. So it's Chris Delion and uh, chat more with y'all soon. Thanks.